Nearly 20 years ago, Matt and I walked the wild west coast northwards from Port Davey. We passed the 1914 shipwreck of the Svenor before turning eastwards over mountains and rivers to finish at Lake Pedda. It was a special journey and we had long spoken of returning. Now, 20 years later, we hoped to cross the golden plains we had seen stretching northwards to Low Rocky Point and beyond. Some expeditions aren't anything like you imagined they were going to be. As you study a route on maps and satellite images, you build a mental picture of what it will look like, how hard it will be, and what obstacles are present. With experience, you can plan how many days it will take, how much food you will need, how heavy the loads will be. But the reality in remote wilderness areas is that you are at the mercy of conditions you cannot control. The legendary John Chapman describes walking the 220 kilometre coastline from Port Davy to Strawn as the greatest remote wilderness route in Tasmania, and the hardest. His notes describe a full month of difficult walking where the technical terrain and thick scrub limit the ground that can be covered. The northern half of this coast is part of the Sparrow Wilderness, a large area of plains and wild coast south of Macquarie Harbour that remains unprotected outside of the World Heritage Area. This spectacular area of wild seas and coastal plains was an abundant source of food for the Tasmanian Aboriginal people. I'd long wanted to paddle the remote Wanderer River that crosses through the heart of this wilderness, but after studying maps, Matt pointed out that the most remote major river of all was the Lewis. It started in the foothills of the remote Lawson Range and marks the border between the Sparrow Wilderness and Southwest National Park. Just getting to the Lewis looked like it would take a week. Getting out? Maybe two more. We wanted to be there in the wetter months to ensure there would be enough flow. Our ultimate plan was to link the four major rivers that drain this corner of the state by traversing the sections of coast and ranges between them. Once we'd drawn the route out, we joked that it looked like a snakes and ladders board where the ranges and coast that we followed towards the top of the map were the ladders and the rivers we flowed down were the snakes. When I was small, Dad used to tell me half-made-up stories about the adventures of a man with a tractor who lived at Maluka near Port Davy. How he mined the gable for tin and built huts for bushwalkers and explored the coast for shipwrecks. Later I learned about Denny King that these stories were based on and his love of this place and the orange belly parrots that he helped to protect. When Dad told me about this plan to walk from Port Davy to Strawn, I was in. It sounded spectacular, but I had no idea how hard it would be. Our flight to Melaleuca was in perfect weather, but the forecast wasn't great with warnings for strong winds followed by rain. At Melaleuca we weighed our enormous loads. With boats and food for three weeks, mine was 46 kilos. Oh my gosh, it's Yeah, feels horrendous. What a monster. A couple of hours later, we were alone at the mouth of Bathurst Harbour, waving the boat farewell. Thank you. With a forecast for strong offshore winds, we decided to walk the first section behind Mount Milner and avoid the tidal races where Bathurst Harbour flows into Port Davy until we could assess what the more open water looked like. The loads were heavy, and it was with some enthusiasm that we discovered at Tugalo Beach that the swell into Port Davy was mild, and so we hit the open water. Our last contact was with some fishermen who told us conditions would be okay today, but we'd be best off the water by tomorrow afternoon. As we pushed up the bay, we noted some of the major landmarks of our trip getting closer. Castle Mountain that we hoped to be climbing tomorrow looked particularly ominous, with approaching rain behind. 
Overnight, the temperature fell and the realities of a late April trip where we had made significant sacrifices of warm gear to make room for food became apparent. A brisk wind greeted us back on the bay, but there were minimal waves and we soon crossed the barway into the Davy River mouth and to our surprise enjoyed a few hours of sunshine as we paddled up the Davy and then the DeWitt River towards the base of Castle Mountain. Now this appears to be the corner where we get out and then have a waltz up the hill. Exiting the DeWitt proved to be our first unexpected challenge. Then finally we were on our route with a tough grind up onto Castle Mountain under our excruciatingly heavy loads. As we climbed, I got my first views of the major southwest peaks rising above the Davy River and the sun on the beaches stretching towards Southwest Cape. Near the summit, we pitched our tent in the lee of a rock face. From a rocky outcrop nearby, I got my first views of Low Rocky Point. It looked remote and wild with the squalls of rain sweeping toward us over Mount Heen. And I knew we had two rivers to paddle before we'd be there, but it was a major landmark and I was very keen. During the night, the wind had turned southerly and increased in intensity, requiring a peg revision around 3am. The morning was grim, with sideways rain and no visibility. Behind the official castle mountain, the range climbs higher to an unnamed peak. This high point is actually the highest peak in the entire area, and it was with some misgivings that we climbed this rarely attained summit to get no views. But as we descended, the massive Propstin range appeared. Matt and I had camped on top of that summit on a perfectly still evening 19 years ago, only to have our tent flattened hours later by gale force winds. It was amusing that we nearly had a repeat last night. As we descended, we eyed the upper Giblin River. Surprisingly, it already looked big enough to paddle. So this is the Giblin River guys, this is um, the peak of our trip. I mean it's faster than walking, that's for sure. After the cold start, it turned into a pleasant afternoon until the river coursed between some low hills and entered a meandering flat full of log jams. Yep. We climbed to spend a night on a clear ridge top to bypass the log jam section and we aimed to meet the Giblin a kilometre downstream where it was clear on satellite imagery. A long, long time ago, John and I bashed down that creek and up onto the Frosty Range. Back in 2004, when Matt and I crossed this valley, the river had been lush and green, but a bushfire in 2013 had raised the valley. We wished we'd come back to paddle the river sooner as the next section was lovely. The autumn water levels made it a fun, bouncy little river with several spectacular little gorges and waterfalls. Some of the waterfalls dropped from side streams directly into the river. This bit of the Giblin was fun. Minimal log jams, lots of fast rapids and a high peaks and bluffs around each corner. Although the burnt sticks were a detractor, being able to see the plains and views made it quite different from the gorges of most Tasmanian rivers and I really enjoyed it. Best of all, we were making progress with our humongous loads carrying us rather than the other way around. At times, we were met head on by the ferocious wind we had encountered earlier and squalls of rain kept passing over. 
but the relief of just moving forward without carrying our heavy loads was worth the discomfort. This section carried us nearly 13 kilometres before the river started to slow down and widen. Soon, sections of unburnt rainforest reappeared. A nice bit. Then the log jams started. We had been expecting this from aerial imagery and the meandering course on the map. We knew from experience that sections like this are often unnavigable. Our plan had always been to cut west across what looked like open plains, while the river took a great bend north. Around 3pm, the air temperature suddenly seemed to fall and the sky turned dark with heavy clouds. We made a decision to find a tent site within the shelter of the forest. She's wet and cold. And then it poured all night as the cold of a low pressure system spiralled through the Southern Ocean. Messages from home told us there was snow falling to low levels and we had to wear all our clothes in our light bags to stay warm. Leaving the river involved pushing through moderate scrub which left us soaked as we laboured across the flats and onto the sprawling ridges that run from Mount Gaffney. In 2004, John and I had watched a stunning sunset over these plains from the high areas of the DeWitt Range and we knew that once we got up this side, flowing plains would take us all the way back to the Lower Giblin. Before then, there was one particularly large creek to cross that was fast and swollen after the rain. We had to work our way along the side of it to a slower, fordable point. The fresh westerly wind carried fast moving clouds which brought everything from hail to welcome patches of sun which we tried to time our breaks in. By afternoon we were finally on the plains and they didn't disappoint. Although some areas required energy sapping wading through thicker vegetation, mostly they were firm underfoot and fast to move over. The views excited us. To our west was the coast and the high dunes around the mouth of the Giblin that we hoped to reach tomorrow. Directly ahead was the dark outline of the Lawson Range, over which we would have to climb to reach the headwaters of the Lewis River. It was slightly disappointing to leave the open vistas of the plains and re-enter the dark forest next to the river to make camp. But the rain soon returned, and it is always easier in the mornings to pack gear into the boats rather than rucksacks. Back out on the Giblin. You've got to watch where you're going. The lower Giblin was moving briskly near our camp, but it gradually became broader and changed in nature to a slow-moving, beautiful estuary. Matt and I had long anticipated paddling between the extensive dunes behind Nye Bay, where the Giblin ended in idyllic golden sunlight. What we got instead was a genuine fight against a fierce headwind with wind-whipped sand stinging our eyes. We tried to hug the lee shore and get in shelter behind reeds. It was still sensational to be in such a place though, and we each had a sense of excitement when we came around a corner to face the river mouth. In the distance across Nye Bay was Elliot Hill, where the National Park ended. Beyond that was the Sparrow Wilderness. At the river mouth, the gusts of wind were so strong that packing up boats was a challenge. Any item not held down would be whipped from your possession across the river. We recalled 1969 footage of a Launceston walking club group that had been dropped off by Denny King and they made a raft out of flotsam to cross here. We doubt they'd have been able to do it in today's wind. Our walk up the beach was far from the beautiful experience I'd been anticipating for months. The wind and the soft sand made it hard. It was a relief to find No Mean Creek eventually offered some shelter for our planned early finish. The Aboriginal people named the Giblin River Go Novar, the Friendly River, and No Mean Me was one of their settlements on the edge of extensive plains that would have provided good hunting. The edge of Nye 
Bye bye. This is a main creek. The button grass here was thicker and it was an energy sapping grind inland from the coast to the foothills of the Lawson Range. My mind was distracted as we crossed the plains. David's boat was badly damaged. I had come around a corner and felt a sudden jolt as my boat suddenly stopped. Oh, that's not what you wanted. Careful of this, it's very bad. At the time, I didn't realise, but I'd torn the floor of my boat badly on a submerged log. By the end of the giblin, the tear had extended and the second tear started on the other side. The clearest line took us over a convoluted ridge into a bowl at the base of the range before a steep climb up. Lunch was next to a steep creek where we could barely operate our fingers from the cold. On a clear day, the slopes of the Lawson Range would provide one of the best wilderness views in Tasmania. Instead, we got glimpses of the Giblin and the coast between fast moving clouds and squalls. I reckon that's the Giblin Plains. As the light began to fade, finding a sheltered tent site became an urgent priority, but it was difficult to locate an area big enough between the tussocks with any degree of shelter from the wind. We did the best we could and settled in for another cold and windy night. 7.23pm. We're inside, reading our Kindles listening to yet another rainstorm. On and on. The Lawson Range is a contender for the most remote mountain range in Tasmania, but surrounded by untracked wilderness in every direction. We had been dreaming of this summit for ages, so it was disappointing to traverse it in horrendous conditions. Every single item we could use was necessary to keep us functioning. For a trip of this magnitude, equipment compromises must be made. Matt and David had chosen to use their heavy but warm paddling cags as a raincoat during the walking sections. I chose to use bushwalking waterproofs, which were colder for paddling, but more suited to these conditions. The jury is still out on which technique works best. After some lunch, we spotted the distinct flat-topped Moors lookout, and then we officially arrived at the upper Lewis River. With all the rain, it was more of a flowing plain, and we waded and clambered across it, aiming for higher ground on the west side. Ultimately, we found a place to put the tent in the least sodden patch of ground on top of a bare, windswept knoll right on dusk. And then, in the night, it finally stopped. We awoke to a clear, still dawn and gentle mist in the valley at our feet. To our south stood the Lawson Range, as if nothing had happened. What was one more storm in its time watching over this land? Across from us, the sun rose behind Mount Jean and Dolphin Ridge. We wondered who, if anyone, had stood in this valley since T.B. Moore and his two dogs, Spiro and Wanderer, had bashed through here in the 1890s, looking for a route to Port Davy. A little above our camp was a hill where we finally got some views that somewhat made up for the poor visibility from the Lawson summit. The Sparrow Wilderness stretched out before us with the Valley of the Lewis dominating the foreground. Many of the prominent high points were unnamed, but to the north we recognised some landmarks. The characteristic Moors Lookout with its flat top stands sentinel between the headwaters of the Wanderer River and a major branch of the Lewis River. Matt and I had studied this country from the top of the Charles Range six months earlier, watching the shadows change in the valleys on a perfect summer evening. 
That trip, we passed just north of Moore's Lookout, following the route of early explorers around the Wanderers' headwaters towards the Olga River and a mysterious limestone tunnel that hadn't been visited since its discovery by Neil Thomas in the 1990s. Seeing those summits in the distance from the south highlighted just how remote we now were. For two days, I had spent considerable mental energy coming up with ways to hold David's boat together, but then my partner sent a satellite message with great news. Parks and Wildlife had very kindly approved a permit for Tasmanian helicopters to drop us a replacement boat, as long as we didn't leave any of the damaged craft behind. Plan was, they would drop the replacement boat from the air, but if we could identify a place they could land, they would save us a huge amount of weight and carry the damaged boat out too. We did have some hesitance about this option. We liked the idea of three weeks with no contact from the outside, but in reality, we were dependent on modern technology to complete this trip, and the idea of bashing out from the upper Lewis after so much planning and effort was not attractive. Finally heading down to the Lewis was really exciting. We were certain it would have enough volume to paddle now it had dropped into a small gorge after leaving the plains. Our first nice surprise was what had looked like thick scrub was actually open floor Manaluka. The second was although shallow the river looked great. We would be paddling in the morning. But I had an important job to do first. Installing the braces from the damaged boat into my trusty old green boat. What if you get stuck? Despite being in the forest, we woke to our first frost. At least the sun was out and icy toes couldn't dampen our enthusiasm. It's happening! We remain unaware of anyone previously paddling the whole Lewis River so far up, only that people have explored the lower estuary and sea kayaks from fishing boats. Ahead of us was about 50 kilometres of winding river architecture all the way to the coast. There's a coldness coming down it. Oh, there's a coldness? I don't know if you noticed it in the middle last night, but on my side of the tent, I was catching a... The first section was magnificent rainforest, and we knew there were some longer sections of rapids and waterfalls to come. The mist off the water and light through the trees was perfect and we would have loved to linger here and take more photographs. Later, we found the prettiest waterfall that spanned the entire river. If this were on any river more widely known, it would no doubt be named. Instead, we wondered when the last time was that any humans had stood there. After the delightful morning, the afternoon was more challenging. Even with higher water levels, the slower water away from the hills had allowed a lot of logs to collect. Progress was still good, but it was more work and less carefree. It even rained again, just to remind us what it was like. Oh no. We'll come in handy. Oh! <sighs> 
We pushed late and consequently chose a rather muddy spot to camp. If only someone had told us beforehand about the beautiful rainforest bank about half an hour on. It's been pretty. Somehow the river seemed easier in the morning. We transitioned to more open lands where the extensive hunting plains of the original inhabitants came down to the river. So this bend is the southernmost point in the Lewis River. And here we go north to meet the Hudson River and then go to the coast. Hudson River. Just past the Hudson River, a rusting iron bridge still stands where the low rocky point track once crossed on its way from Macquarie Harbour. Cut in the 1960s, modified snow machines called bombardiers were used to service the navigation light at low rocky point. But the track also supported mining companies who even converted part of it to an airfield. A reminder that periodic mineral exploration had occurred in this wild place. We still had 14 kilometres of river to the coast we expected a long afternoon paddle, probably with a headwind. We were delighted to come around a corner and find rapids, and not just one. For nearly nine kilometres, the river had small, gentle rapids with good flow between them that carried us past plains and forests. Finally, four kilometres from the coast, we met low waves and gentle flow coming towards us. I'd stopped to take a photo and there was a bit behind the others to reach the mouth of the river where a small inlet gives a shelter from the big swells. Dad was beckoning for me to go to him, but he was heading towards the open sea. When I got there, I could see why. It was amazing. We were on the edge of a wilderness riding the waves of an ocean that goes halfway around the planet. It was wild. The next morning was actually warm for once, so we ferried back across the Lewis to make the trip out to Low Rocky Point, where the wide plains would be easy going. The mountains we had dragged ourselves over to get here looked distant and gave the plains a vast openness. Castle Mountain was clearly visible, and the propsing range in a very distant greystone bluff stood tall behind Elliot Hill. We could see all the way down to Southwest Cape, along with the dunes at Nye Bay, where we had met the coast six days ago. All of the Lawson Range was clear, a stark contrast when we were up there. Closer to Low Rocky Point, we met the old Bombardier track, however it was faint and nearly unfollowable once it met the dense tea tree. It ended at the navigation light, so it was another half hour of bashing and weaving through the scrub to reach the actual point. I was really keen to dive off the end of the rocks, but as I came around a large boulder, I discovered another group had beaten me to it. About 200 seals were basking in the sun and playing in the shallow pools. When some of the bulls saw me, they started barking to call the young ones, but many just stayed lazily in the sun. I was very tempted to join them. However, it wasn't long before I discovered a second reason not to swim there, the thousands of mosquitoes enjoying the seal buffet. Luckily, behind the point is a sheltered coastal lawn, where the mosquitoes were less tense, so I could still have my swim. After the visit to Low Rocky Point, we relaxed on wide marsupial lawns to watch the evening light. We had originally considered using the old Low Rocky Point tracks to move north to the Wanderer. We all agreed that this coast was special and should be our route instead. However, with the number of days taken by other parties as a guide, in our usual fashion, we weren't sure that we'd have enough food. Ultimately, I think the open green areas here lulled us into thinking it would be straightforward. It started off so well. We cruised along the coastal lawns and beaches, then past the Viridian Point rock formations, by the time we reached the shank we had covered 9 kilometres and it was only mid-morning. Through the morning the wind had been increasing and out to sea we could see squalls approaching, a weather pattern that would continue for the remainder of the expedition. The shank is a calm anchorage 
but when we rounded the point, we were suddenly hit by the wind in the first squall. From then on, everything got incrementally harder. The seas rose, the wind rose, but the temperature fell. We paddled across the protected entrance of the Mainwaring River and camped below some bluffs. Although we'd managed 18 kilometres, it was clear that it would be much slower from here. Evidence of the first people's lives exists all along this coast north of Low Rocky Point. We saw one of the most striking examples. Overlooking a protected bay in full view of the water were a row of large depressions, three to four metres in diameter. These were once hut sites that formed a comforting village on the edge of the wild ocean. Very quietly, we looked around at this place where life and society existed long before ours, with great skill and knowledge to survive a harsh environment. As we climbed out of this bay, I took one look back. It would have been a welcoming vista to those returning home. The Southwest Nations were the Ninine of Port Davie, the Lorene around Low Rocky Point, and the Mimogen people who lived around Birch's Inlet and Macquarie Harbour. They were removed at gunpoint through 1833 and forcibly shipped to Flinders Island. On my notes from the trip, I called the next day Gulches and Ledges Coast. The direct distance covered was five and a half kilometres, though we walked nine kilometres in steps and felt like we'd run a marathon. Most of that distance was gained on one section of shingles. The rest was eight hours of unyielding scrub, ravines and gulches while the wind hurtled past. It was also one of the most spectacular sections of coast I've ever walked. High Rocky Point looked close, but never any closer. The ocean was amazing. You'd literally be 10 to 20 metres up, clinging to a rock ledge, and yet the crest of the breaking waves still looked higher than us. We had thought at Low Rocky that if the weather had remained stable, we could have paddled across some of the gulches, but that would have been a suicide mission. We had a sense of urgency, but there was nothing you could do to make it go faster. From 3pm, we started keeping watch for any sort of sheltered clearing with room for a tent. Who knew how far it would be to the next one? High Rocky Point had dominated our view north for three days and it was a major milestone to finally reach it. Chapman's notes indicated two more hard days to the wanderer with more gulches and dense scrub, but we were desperate to make up a day. We'd found a clear looking lead north behind the point and decided to give it a go. It started off well, but later became a nightmare. Which way out, cover? It ended in a desperate dash wading down a steep creek to Hartwell Cove on the edge of darkness. Rather than gain a day, we were fortunate to have not lost one. Christmas Cove and the Wanderer looked close, but after yesterday's scrub and all the coasts and gulches, I was impatient. The ridge out of Hartwell Cove became increasingly scrubby, so we pushed to the shore hoping that more gulches wouldn't impede us too much. Finally, we reached the river mouth, and after the challenges of the coast, it felt like a major achievement. Wanderer River, mate. Long time in the making. Uh, 
I hard bash from Hartwell Cove, but did it in just under two and a quarter hours, so that's great. I think that gets us pretty much back onto where we need to be for our schedule. Yeah. Um, have a bit of a photography session here, and then head up the Wanderer. We were receiving messages that people thought we'd have to push to the Bombardier track, but we had meticulously planned a route from the Wanderer to the Sparrow that we believed would be straightforward and was a key to the success of this route. Unlike the Lewis and Giblin, the Wanderer and Sparrow have hewn pine stands. The Sparrow hewns were partially cut in the middle of the last century, but we didn't see such evidence on the Wanderer. Yet another cold front hit us as we passed from the still lower estuary to where the current was against us. Ultimately, we reached our target, a small gravelly creek where we packed up for our planned traverse. Our route led up a remarkable knife-edge ridge onto a perfectly flat plateau. We made it three quarters of the way up before the light faded. The plateau is the back end of the Warunrim Plains, the Aboriginal word for the wanderer. The geology here is remarkable and unique. Ancient conglomerate sediments that create unique erosion gullies on the edge of the gravelly plains, quite striking both on the ground and from satellite views. These erosion gullies are the result of high rainfall on thin vegetation cover over gravel soils. Our plan worked. After heavy wading through thick moorland grasses, we stood looking into the Spiro Valley. We reached the river where it left the plains and became rainforest. Almost immediately, we were struck by its beauty. Spiro River. Yeah, made the spear. The final river. Have a shadow. Hello. Oh. Thought it rains again, which doesn't look far away, does it? Beautiful. I was captivated. This river was magical. The soft light, stunning forest and gentle mist had me seeing images everywhere. David and John kept getting ahead of me as I'd stop and take more pictures. We were all completely drenched and it was quite clear they weren't running on my adrenaline and were freezing. So we pulled up a shingle bank and pitched a tent in the dark, dripping forest An hour later, I was freezing too and barely able to get my wet gear off. That night was wintry. But next day was special. We were cold from the outset after putting soaked gear back on, but then the mist turned golden and the river showed us its beauty and sunlight. Sunshine! Reaching the end of the Spiro sort of felt like we had completed the journey. It was after all our last river. However, we were still actually six days from Strawn and home. Fortunately, the coast from here is a little easier than the batch up to High Rocky Point. And so, after the luxury of sitting in some rare warm sun eating Christmas cake, we got to stretch our legs with an open beach as we made our way north. How do we feel? Well, pretty good actually. Going well, body's holding up. Only broken half our gear. Half? Yeah. Well, kind of. But it's a beautiful day. We've actually had to have many days in the sun, so this is a great start for the day. It's not raining yet. Hopefully it stays that way, yeah, but... um. forecast isn't great. Head round this shore over some cliffy bits. 
and then much easier beach walking than rocky walking in theory. <laughs> but in theory. We've had some shocking days as well. So. Finally, Hierarchy Point was receding into the distance behind us. I'm a fair way since then. But even better was cresting the Grass Hill to see the iconic Hibs Pyramid. Tell us about this map, mate. Well, it's a work in progress. If you don't put anything on here and here, the baffles just keep popping in each direction. So I've got three straps around it to, to reduce that, but here is a section in the middle. I will attempt to tie back another strap. Where do you put your head? <laughs> <laughs> it's hopeless, mate. It's ridiculously hopeless. Line it like this, oh, yeah. my head up there. Yeah, yeah. With just this skinny little thing down the middle to try not to roll off. The Sparrow Coast was sensational and well worth the week of walking to come out at Strawn. We still had a lot of distance to cover and it was hard to not stop and spend more time taking in the views and inspecting the cultural living sites that we saw all the way along this spectacular coast. But we were also tired and constantly cold. It was now May and squalls of heavier rain were raising the river levels and the sun gave little warmth. I'd heard of an old hut. It didn't take much in the sideways rain to convince Matt and David that we should find it. It was just what we needed. Outside, rain pelted the roof and the wind was unrelenting, but we were cosy inside for one night. The next section of coast looked reminiscent of the gulches near High Rocky Point. The temptation to cut across the trail from the hut to Macquarie Harbour to exit was strong. But after so much effort, we wanted to complete our planned route. It was worth it. The next section was hard but sensational as we inched our way towards Sloop Point. We didn't know it, but the last really hard section of the trip ended as we waded across Dunes Creek. The sky became an amazing mix of rain, sun and sea spray as we pushed into the late afternoon for one final night in this wilderness. After travelling over 350 kilometres during three weeks, while feeling like we were almost constantly cold and wet, it was a truly magical experience to have the evening sunshine bring an end to our last full day as we quietly walked up the beach. Overnight frost meant we had to endure one last morning of cold socks. However, the sun was soon out to take us home. Tell us the story. It's not raining. Come on. Well done. Then it was over. With a turn onto an old track, we left the shores that we had followed for nearly two weeks. We took one final side trip to the impressive Sorel Lighthouse. The coast we had followed stretched beyond sight to the south. Just inside Macquarie Heads, behind Bonnet Island, we inflated the boats for a final paddle. The final hours of this remarkable journey were done with mixed emotions. 
The expedition had been unrelentingly hard, with massive daily efforts for over three weeks straight. There was relief and elation at nearing the end of this route precisely in the time we had allowed. We also had a deep sense of awe and respect for the original inhabitants, the Ninine, Lorene and Mimogen people, whose world had come to life for us as we moved through it. Our overwhelming response is an urge to protect this precious, unique region and to show people what it contains in the hope that it will be protected forever. Got something to say to your fans? Well, we're at the Giblin River. It's cold, windy. sandy, windy. Um, day six, 23 to go. Um, <laughs> no. Oh yeah, a bit less than that. Oh, well. Fans are happy, happy.